Balance is never the answer, but in some cases, it's extremely necessary. While wrestling can take on many forms like taut family drama, a sporting game of one-upsmanship between two esteemed athletes, or whatever the hell all the ants were on about in Chikara, at the root of it all is violence, and some practitioners and federations have taken this core value and dialed it up to 11. Whether it's the brute physical force of monsters like Vader and Stan Hansen punching people so hard their souls exploded, Undertaker and Kane setting people on fire and being ghouls, or the ultraviolence from companies like CZW, Big Japan, ECW and FMW, violence in wrestling is just something you can't turn away from, no matter how much you may want to. But before we start, it's important to note that we are highlighting violent wrestling personas rather than wrestlers who were horrible bullying bastards outside the ring, as in a lot of cases, the most extreme wrestlers are some of the friendliest in real life. There are exceptions, of course. I'm Adam Pacitti from Cultaholic Wrestling, and these are the 10 most violent wrestlers ever. Join us. Number 10, Terry Funk. In an industry where the term legend gets banded about a bit too easily, Terry Funk is one of the few wrestlers who has truly earned the title. A former NWA World's Heavyweight Champion, Terry's work in the 70s with brother Dory opened roads into Japan for many gaijin wrestlers, while their time as the villainous Funk brothers in the NWA made them two of the most hated wrestlers of the time. Terry in particular pushed the boundaries to places they had seldom been before. He once tried to remove Jerry Lawler as I in an empty arena match, attempted to suffocate Ric Flair with a plastic bag, never mind the fact that he was so hated he has been legitimately stabbed and shot at by fans on at least a couple of occasions. That is enough for any career, but this was merely the first half of Funk's. He later helped put ultra-violent hardcore wrestling on the map with his work in the legendary King of the Deathmatch tournament and his wince-inducing barbed wire no-rope deathmatches in ECW, the latter of which sowed the seeds for Paul Heyman's Philadelphia-based promotion to grow into a monster. And if throwing hundreds of chairs at his opponents didn't work, Funker would just try to set them on fire or brand them instead. Middle-aged and crazy was an under statements. Number 9, John Zandig. John Zandig is a divisive figure. To some, he is merely a glorified backyarder who promoted dangerous wrestling with little regard for his performer's safety, while to others, he carried on the legacy of Paul Heyman's ECW, upping the ante and providing a true alternative to the mainstream for American wrestling fans. Whatever side of the fence you sit on, you can't deny Zandig's success, turning CZW from training school into overnight deathmatch sensation with his massive incoherent self front and center. While contemporaries like Necro Butcher and Nick Mondo are arguably more notorious, Zandig takes their place on this list for the fact that he was CZW's heart and soul for many years, and for just how crazy his matches were, usually with him dishing out the most extreme violence. Zandig was happy to take it as well, whether getting dragged behind a car, hung from meat hooks, or with light tube after light tube after light tube. But we can't gloss over the ridiculous beatings he handed out. There was the time he launched June Kasai off a truck onto concrete, or the time he mother effing bombed Joey Janela off a building through a flaming truck and nearly killed him. Yes, that actually happened. Jesus! Number 8, Mick Foley. Everywhere he wrestled, Mick Foley turned heads for his boundary pushing. His brawls with Vader in WCW were so violent that he lost an ear. His performance in the King of the Deathmatch tournament cemented his legacy, while his work in ECW served as a precursor to the storylines and mic work that would make him a legend in WWE. A savage one-eared force of nature, Foley's performances earned him derision as a glorified stuntman from the likes of Ric Flair, while on the other hand, he influenced an entire generation of wrestlers as he put his body on the line time and time again. Unlike others on this list, Foley's intense violence wasn't just physical, as his work as Mankind was some of the most disturbing and barbaric storytelling ever told on WWE TV. From the brutal attack on Jim Ross during an interview segment, the promos from the boiler room, or the way he would sit and squeal as he ripped out his own hair, Mankind was genuinely disturbing. Throw in the fact that he introduced thumbtacks to WWE and was prone to delivering and receiving bouts of extreme physical aggression in the ring, and you have arguably the most violent wrestler WWE has ever seen. 
Number 7. Jun Kasai Take a look at Jun Kasai. Looks like a nice, mild-mannered fella, doesn't he? He certainly makes an impression with his weird white eyes, three teeth, and a network of scars that make Sabu and Hayabusa look like wimps, while usually holding some kind of big knife in his hand, by the way. Given the nickname Crazy Monkey, Kasai is just that, as you never know whether he's going to be playful and weird, or whether he'll start screaming and hurling his own poo at people. Regardless, in either scenario, you can guarantee that he will be bleeding. A lot. A mainstay of Big Japan Pro Wrestling and Combat Zone Wrestling, Kasai's matches are not for the faint of heart. His work regularly involves razor blades, light tubes, barbed wire, and even cacti as weapons, and he once got cut so deep by a light tube in a CZW bout that it exposed the bone in his arm. Kasai matches really are a sight to behold. But he's no mere backyard garbage wrestler. Kasai can go in the ring as seen in his work with Zero One. He can also bring joviality into his matches, wrestling comedy bouts in promotions like DDT Pro, and has even competed in Joshi Federation Ice Ribbon. That said, still wouldn't cross him even on a good day though. He looks like he would eat you. Number 6. Toshiaki Kawada Violent wrestling isn't all about light tubes, thumbtacks, and weed whackers. At its core, it's all about smacking someone in the face as hard as you can. Arguably, nobody has ever done this better than Toshiaki Kawada. One of the four pillars of heaven of 90s All Japan, Kawada was famed for being stiffer than Eric Bischoff after a blue chew, and for his love of booting people in the head like they were footballs. Kawada was so violent and tough that his displays earned him the nickname Dangerous K, and even hard-hitting nutters like Minoru Suzuki and Katsuyori Shibata ended up on the wrong side of Kawada's strikes. He wasn't just some one-trick martial arts kicking pony, though. Kawada was a hell of a wrestler, with his All Japan work regarded as some of the greatest wrestling matches ever, whether flying solo against the likes of rival Mitsuharu Mizawa, or breaking people in half with tag partner Akira Tawe as the incredibly named Holy Demon Army. The one chance you had against Kawada was hoping to outstrike him and praying he didn't get up, because if he did, this hulking no-toothed madman would kick you so hard you would soil yourself. Or if you really pissed him off, he would attempt to kill you with the Ganso Bomb. Number 5. Bruiser Brody much has been said about Bruiser Brody both here and elsewhere. His popularity around the world, the fact that he was a legitimate attraction with incredible drawing power, and his wild brawls that set the stage for hardcore wrestling. Brody was a true force of nature, and if he wasn't making Japanese audiences run for their lives as he swung a giant chain over his head, then he was probably battering Abdullah the Butcher or Carlos Colon, and weeping buckets of blood in the process. But despite his no-nonsense approach to wrestling, and his brisk if not difficult nature backstage, outside of wrestling, Frank Goodish was known to be a family man first and foremost, and embarked on his many tours of the globe in order to provide for his wife and child. Bruiser Brody, however, was not Frank Goodish, and for all of the violent bravado and OTT nature of his matches and his persona, he was not afraid to batter an opponent for real to help boost the aura of Brody. Unfortunately, it's this blurring of fiction and reality which is believed to be a factor in Brody's murder in Puerto Rico in 1988. Number 4. Nick Gage Nick Gage does not look like your average wrestler. Balding with chipped teeth and four-day-old stubble, he looks more like a man who would beat you with a hammer in a rough pub for £2.50 and a Nokia 3310. And that is why he's utterly terrifying. The first ever CZW World Heavyweight Champion, it says a lot about Gage's in-ring demeanor that he holds that accolade, and his matches in CZW exemplified its ultra-violent no Fs given attitude to deathmatch wrestling. Gage is also the only man in wrestling to have won the Deathmatch Holy Trinity, the CZW Tournament of Death, GCW Tournament of Survival, and the infamous IWA King of the Deathmatch. Like most others on this list, Gage's work is not for the faint of heart. He once got impaled on a broken light tube, almost bled to death, cut a promo while doing so, was airlifted away where he died in the helicopter, and then was resuscitated. Somehow, this wasn't the end of his career as he was back one week later. His career wasn't even ended when he spent five years in jail for robbing a bank, and last year he stabbed David Arquette in the neck with a light tube. I'm sorry, am I reading a wrestling script here? or a rap sheet of a GTA character. Number 3. New Jack Take out your violent wrestler's bingo card and put a big inky dot on New Jack. 
Chances are, before you clicked on this vid, you were expecting the original gangster to appear, and I'm expecting a flood of comments down below saying, expecting New Jack to be number one, actually, dickhead. So, yeah, New Jack. Where to start with New Jack? Might as well go with the greatest hits, eh? The mass transit incident, where he cut a teenager very deep in an ECW match. The Danbury fall and aftermath, where he got brain damaged in a botched stunt and later tried to murder Vic Grimes in revenge. The baseball bat incident, where he did his best Wade Boggs impression with Gypsy Joe's head, and he also stabbed somebody nine times in a match in Florida. And this is all from a man allegedly with a handful of justifiable homicides to his name. So where does New Jack the wrestler end and Jerome Young the man begin? It's hard to tell, really. Years of living a hard life on the road, numerous substance abuse issues, and living the gimmick would be enough to break any wrestler, but when that gimmick is a stable gun-wielding thug who doesn't care about anyone, it must be pretty hard to switch off. Number two, Abdullah the Butcher. Abdullah the Butcher in his prime was a sight to behold. Built like Jabba the Hutt and usually gushing with blood out of every pore, Abdullah was one of the founding fathers of what we know as hardcore wrestling today. His work in the 70s and 80s made wrestling more violent, more of a wild spectacle, and people could not look away. A special attraction all over the world, it was his work in Puerto Rico and Japan that made Abdullah an icon, as he routinely clashed with biggest rival Bruiser Brody and stabbed many people with forks during manic blood baths. I mean, just look at the state of his head. He's bladed so much in his career that his dome is an utter mess, with Mick Foley claiming that Big Abby can slot gambling chips into his forehead grooves. But for all his trailblazing, his story also has its fair share of controversy. From blading opponents with little regard, to actively wrestling and bleeding buckets while hepatitis C positive, Abdullah's legacy is a spotty one, with superstar Billy Graham absolutely fuming when Abdullah was inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame. And that's without mentioning his Chamber of Horrors match at WCW Halloween Havoc 1991. Yikes. Number one, Atsushi Anita. Without Atsushi Anita, this list would look very different indeed. The founder of Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling, Anita pioneered deathmatch wrestling and for a while in the 90s, turned it into a must-see money-making art form. A prodigious talent in all Japan, Onita first got a taste for wild brawls during an excursion in Texas, then became all Japan's junior ace during the junior heavyweight boom of the early 80s. Injuries forced Onita to retire in 1985, but he returned three years later with a chip and a barbed wire baseball bat on his shoulder, and soon after, FMW was born. Barbed wire rope matches, exploding ring matches, wild fights on floating rings surrounded by explosives, all were cooked up by Anita, and he was usually in the thick of it dishing it out as FMW's biggest star, as well as its mad scientist. Still, the weirdest thing about Onita's ultra-violent style of wrestling is just how popular it was, with some FMW shows drawing an excess of 30,000 spectators, all of them enamored with Onita, contemporaries like Mr. Pogo, and innovative superstars Hayabusa and Megumi Kodo. So while some of the wrestlers that came after him up to the ante in terms of visceral carnage, Onita takes top place for what he created. Often imitated, never duplicated, it takes a special type of lunatic to create such a memorable deathmatch dynasty.